Good evening, ladies. Welcome to our Bible study again this evening and to our Philippians chapter 1 study. Let's just commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much that again this evening we have the privilege of sitting uh, at your feet, as it were, to hear from you from your word. And Lord, I just want to pray this evening for the grace that we need and the strength that we need, both as the speaker and as the hearers. Lord, that we would hear the word from you that you have for us from your word tonight. We love you, Lord. We really want to serve you and glorify you. And so I ask that you will come and teach, teach us through your word this evening how to do that. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been busy with Philippians chapter 1 in this special lockdown series. And we've been camping a little bit on that verse, or those verses in Philippians 1. 20 and 21, you remember where Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We've already looked uh, at some length at the phrase to die is gain. And now we've been spending some time looking at what Paul means when he says to live is Christ. And we've seen that one thing that that implies is that we live our lives in a way that they will not be wasted. And so I've entitled tonight's study, Don't Waste Your Life. And uh, really, what we need to remember is that we only get one chance at this. And therefore it's vital for us to make sure that we live purposely and meaningfully. One person who has thought quite deeply about the question of how not to waste your life, is author John Piper. And in his book, Don't Waste Your Life, he tackles this issue in a really masterful way and in quite a lot of depth. Now, I'll be drawing from his book this evening, but I would really recommend that you read the whole book um, if you are able to. In the opening chapter of his book, <clears throat> he tells the story of how as a young boy, he was gripped by a story that his own father, who was an evangelist, told about an old man who was converted late in life and who wept one evening with, with uh, great tears and sadness about how he had wasted his life. He says, in those early years, God awakened in me a fear and a passion not to waste my life. The thought of coming to my old age and saying through tears, I've wasted it, I've wasted it, was a fearful and a horrible thought to me. Then John Piper goes on and he says, what would it mean to waste my life? That was the burning question. Or more positively, what would it mean to live well, not to waste life, but to how to finish that sentence was the question. I wasn't even sure how to put the question into words, let alone what the answer would be. What's the opposite of not wasting my life? To be successful in a career? Or to be maximally happy? Or to accomplish something great? Or to find the deepest meaning and significance? Or to help as many people as possible? Or to serve Christ to the full? or to glorify God in all I do? Or was there a point, a purpose, a focus, an essence to life that would fulfill every one of those dreams? Well, yes, there is. There is one all-encompassing focus or goal for life that answers every one of those other dreams. Now, last time we we did look a little bit at that one all-encompassing goal for life. We saw that Paul understood from the scriptures the truth that we've all been created in the image of God to glorify God. We've been created for this one main purpose, to glorify God by enjoying and displaying His supreme excellence or value in all spheres of life. And you remember we used 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether we eat or drink, 
or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And you remember last week we saw also that both enjoying and displaying are important here. Because if you try and display how great God is and how wonderful God is um, without any joy, in other words, if you do it just as a duty, well, then you're nothing more than a hypocrite. And what happens is that you tend to obey God out of duty, out of legalism. And that doesn't attract anybody to our great God. But if you claim to enjoy God and never go about displaying something of the greatness of God, well, then you're just deceiving yourself. Because true joy always overflows to share itself with others. If you really enjoy God, if He is your all-satisfying treasure, then you'll want others to be able to share that joy with you. And remember, we, we are called to magnify or glorify God in this world, not like a microscope, but like a telescope, in order to show Him to be as great as he really is. Remember, as uh, John Piper says, in the night sky of this world, God appears to most people, if at all, like a tiny pinprick of light in a heaven of darkness. But he created us and called us to make him look like what he really is. We are meant to image forth in the world what God is really like. And so we waste our lives, in other words, we don't live Christ when we are not praying and thinking and dreaming and planning to magnify God in this way in all areas of our lives. Living for the glory of God, living Christ should have implications for every area of our lives. Our work, our leisure, our marriage, our child rearing, our eating and drinking. And so having this one all-encompassing goal for our lives is in fact, I hope to show you tonight, an intensely practical matter. But now it may be tonight <clears throat> that some of you are sitting here and you're thinking to yourself, but doesn't this mean that God is a bit of an egocentric? I mean, everyone and everything focused on His glory. Doesn't that make God a bit of an egomaniac? And that's a valid objection because it shows that you have actually grasped something of the absoluteness of this biblical call to glorify God, to exist solely for His pleasure and praise and glory. But why is it not wrong for God to demand all the glory and worship and praise to belong to Him alone? Why is it not wrong for God to be so God-focused? Well, obviously because He alone is worthy of all that glory. He alone is God. He alone is the one who is self-existent, who needs nothing or no one. He's the only independent being in the entire universe. Everything else is totally dependent on Him. We owe our very existence, our very next breath to Him. In fact, for God not to want all the glory for Himself would be idolatry. It would be for God to admit that there is someone or something else that is greater or more glorious than he is. And that would mean that he is no longer God, that that something else is in fact God. Now to most people, this doesn't seem like love. They feel used when they hear this. But that is because for most people, being loved means being made much of. We think that love means to increase somebody's self-esteem, to make them feel good about themselves. But that's not how the Bible defines love. Rather, the Bible sees love as doing what is best for someone else. And what is best for them is not to make much of themselves, 
but rather to make much of God. That's the purpose for which we were created. We were created to glorify God. And in this we find what is best for us. We find the highest pleasure, the highest joy. So being loved is not about God making much of us, but in God doing whatever is needed, even at great cost to himself, to help us make much of him, which will ultimately be for our best, for our good. God's love for us is God doing what he must do at great cost to himself so that we might have the highest pleasure, the greatest joy and satisfaction, the pleasure of seeing and glorifying him, enjoying him forever. If it's true, as David says in Psalm 16, that in your presence is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore, then for God to truly love us, he must rescue us from our absorption with ourselves. And he must bring us into his presence to enjoy making much of him forever. Do you see? In order for him to rescue us from this addiction to self, in order to help us enjoy God forever, God went to great lengths. Ladies, God sent his innocent son to die the bloody and shameful death of a criminal on the cruel cross. And he did that. He did whatever it could, the, the highest cost to himself in order to do for us what is best for us, for us to get to know and love him and enjoy him forever. This is what it cost God to rescue us from a wasted life. In other words, from a life not living Christ, not glorifying Him. But what is the wasted life? What does it look like? John Piper uses two illustrations in his book, <clears throat> two stories. He says, in April 2000, two older missionary ladies from their church uh, were serving in Cameroon as missionaries in West Africa. Ruby was 80 years old. She'd been single her whole life and was pouring her life out for making Jesus Christ known to the poor and the unreached and the sick. And then there was Laura, who was a widow, a medical doctor who was also pushing 80, who was serving with Ruby there in the Cameroon. The brakes of their car failed, they went over the cliff, and they were both killed instantly. And then John Piper says, was that a tragedy? No, that was not a tragedy. That was a glory. These lives were not wasted. These lives were not lost. For whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. And I think back on those five missionaries who were killed, Jim Elliot and his four friends in the 1950s, speared to death by the very people that they were seeking to reach with the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Was that a waste? Was that a tragedy? No. Well, what is a tragedy? What is a wasted life? John Piper says, I'll tell you what a tragedy is. Consider this story from the February 1998 edition of the Reader's Digest. It tells about a couple who took early retirement from their jobs, and when he was 59 and she was 51, they moved to Florida where they cruise on their 30-foot yacht, play softball, and collect shells. Tragically, this was their dream. Come to the end of your life, your one and only precious God-given life, and let the last great work of your life be collecting shells, playing softball, and cruising around on your boat. 
Picture them standing before the creator of the universe on judgment day and saying, look, Lord, see my shells? John Piper says, that is a tragedy. And people today are spending billions of dollars to persuade you to embrace that tragic dream. Over against that, he says, I put in my protest, don't buy it. Don't waste your life. Dr. Piper says, oh, how many lives are wasted by people who believe that the Christian life simply means avoiding badness and providing for the family. So there's no adultery. There's no stealing, there's no killing, there's, there's no embezzlement, there's no fraud. Just lots of hard work during the day, lots of TV and PG-13 videos in the evening during quality family time, and lots of fun stuff on the weekend, mostly around church. This is life for millions of people, he says, but it's a wasted life. We were created for more, far more. You see, the point that he's making is that <clears throat> there are very many good things that we can keep ourselves busy with. Things that become enemies of the best things. They make the best things seem dull and boring and less interesting by comparison. We've fallen into the trap of living by what Dr. Piper calls the avoidance ethic. In other words, we think that so long as we don't do this or we don't do that and we keep ourselves from being involved in this or that evil behavior, well then we're okay. But the problem with this is that that doesn't impress too many unbelievers because they're just as good at keeping themselves from certain outward behaviors. They can also live pretty good lives outwardly. And the problem with this avoidance mindset is that it generally is asking the wrong question. The wrong question about our activities and our behavior. We ask, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with this movie? What's wrong with this music or this game or these friends? Or what's wrong with this way of relaxing or this book or this restaurant or shopping at this store? And that kind of question seldom ends in a lifestyle that advertises Jesus Christ as the all-satisfying treasure of our lives. It simply results in a list of don'ts. And it feeds this avoidance ethic. And that really just leads to, to legalism. It needs, it's living by a list. And if I tick off the list, then I'm okay. The better questions to ask about the things I do, is how will this help me treasure Christ more? How will this help me to show that I treasure Christ? How will this help me know Jesus or display Jesus more? How will it help me show others the beauty and value of Jesus? The Bible says whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, or all do all to the glory of God. Did you see that? Whatever you, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In other words, it's mainly positive. It's not negative. It's not don't do this to unglorify God. We need to be doers far more than we be doters. How can I portray God as glorious in this action? How can I enjoy making much of him in this activity? You see, we need something far more radical than just avoiding evil if we are going to show the world something of God's glory and beauty and wonder. We need the mindset of the Apostle Paul here in Philippians chapter 1. And let me just read it to you again to remind us. Paul says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In other words, we need to live life in a way that proves that Jesus is more precious 
than life. Living life, living life in a way that proves that Jesus is more precious than life. If we want others to see and know that Jesus is our greatest treasure, then we have to live in a way that shows that he is more precious to us than life itself. Thy loving kindness is better than life, says David in Psalm 63. My lips will glorify you. Now to do this, we will need to make some sacrificial life choices. Choices that will affect all areas of our lives in order to show how magnifying Christ is far better than magnifying ourselves. For example, in marriage, when I know that Christ is my treasure, that can free me from always seeking to satisfy myself and leads to a more unselfish love in marriage. How I use my money and my possessions will show whether Jesus and the gospel is far more precious to me than my money and my treasures. How I spend my time, how I do my work, how I discipline my children will either make the, ch the, the world see how much I value Jesus Christ, how valuable he is to me, or it would look like what they do, and therefore will not make Christ look really great. As John Piper puts it, Jesus will look like a religious side interest that may be useful for escaping hell, but it doesn't make much difference to how we live and love here. But, if we see ourselves as strangers and pilgrims here on earth, 1 Peter 2.11, and if our citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3.20, and if nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 8.35, and if his loving kindness is better than life, Psalm 63.3, and if all hardship is working for us an eternal weight of glory, 2 Corinthians 4.17, then we can seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6.33. And we can count everything as loss for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord, Philippians 3. And then Christ will be seen to be a treasure so great that the reproach of Christ is greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt, Hebrews 12.26. Now we've said that our goal or our purpose must be to make much of Christ, to glorify God in everything we do. That means practically that however we spend our time every day, whether it is working at a secular job or whether it is working at home as a wife and mother, we should be seeking to glorify God by living in a way that shows others that he is the supreme treasure of our lives. But how do we practically do this? In other words, as John Piper puts it, how do I make much of Christ from eight to five? Let me give you a few. First of all, live your calling with God. 1 Corinthians 7, 17 says, Nevertheless, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. You see, Paul has a very high view of the providence of God, that God has sovereignly assigned or called each of us to the positions in life in which our salvation will have the greatest impact for his glory. It's not an accident that you are where you are, that you are in Volpers Bay, that you are working in the job you're in. That is not an accident. It's part of God's sovereign plan to glorify himself through us where we live. And so he counsels, Paul counsels Christians here, he says, stay where God has called you and live for the glory of God there. You see, becoming a Christian doesn't automatically mean that everybody has to be involved in so-called full-time Christian work. Each one has a calling from God that must be lived out with God and for God's glory. In other words,
words, if God's called you to be a worker at home, Titus 2.5, then live for the glory of God there. And if God has called you to work in a secular job, then live for his glory there. The burning question for each of us must be, how can my life count for the glory of God where he has called me? So live your calling with God. Secondly, we can enjoy fellowship with God throughout the day in all of our work. You see, because Christians never just work, we work with God. That's in fact how 1 Corinthians 7 24 should be translated. The NIV interprets it a bit there, and that makes it a bit unhelpful. The verse literally reads So, brothers and sisters, in whatever condition each was called, let him remain with God. We don't just cook and clean or type or phone or inject or teach. We do these things with God, or at least that's the goal. How can we have this kind of fellowship with God throughout the day, you ask me? Well, let me give you three, three uh, helpful pointers here. First of all, we can practice giving continual thanks to God throughout our day. We can just constantly remind ourselves that any ability to do the work that we are doing is owing to the grace of God. The fact that you can see, hear, touch all the skills of your hands and legs, all your mental abilities to observe and organize and work out problems, all the skills that make you good at this particular job, these are all things that are gifts from God's hand. And if you know this, it can fill you with a continual sense of thankfulness to God. That you can offer up in prayer to God. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart. I will glorify your name forever. Psalm 86, 12. And meditating on the wonder of who God is throughout your day can cause praise to rise up in your heart for you to be able to whisper, Oh God, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Oh Lord my God, you are very great. And if you add to this awareness of your ability to work being a gift of God's grace, if you add to that the awareness that you need God's power, God's strength to be able to live even in the next moment, never mind the next decade of life, when you realize you need his help and strength, that will lead to trusting God for every upcoming moment of the day, for the remainder of the day, the week, the month, the year, the decade. And so you can express in prayer to God that trust with words like, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God, Psalm 31. Or you can say, your steadfast love never ceases. Your mercies have never come to an end. They are new every morning and every afternoon and every evening. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. So we can learn to give continual thanks to God each day as we work. And another good thing to do would be to take the promises of God to work. As you do your work every day, as you go to work, have the promises of God available to you, written in your Bible, or on cards in a prominent place for you to see, or on screensavers on your computer or on your phone, or memorized in your head. Maybe you can make a point of taking just one glorious promise or truth from your morning devotions with you throughout the day to meditate on that. And in that way, God will be speaking to you throughout the day through his promises, through his word. He encourages you and he says, Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So Isaiah 41.10 He will remind you, during the challenges of the day, that they are not hard for him to manage. Behold, I am the Lord, 
The God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Jeremiah 32. He will tell us not to be anxious, but to take everything to him in prayer. Philippians 4, 6. And he will tell us to cast all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. 1 Peter 5, 7. And he promises you that he will guide you through the day. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Psalm 32, 8. You see, in this way, we fellowship with God. We listen to him through his word, thanking him and praising him and calling on him for everything that we need. And it honors God if you stay with God in your work in this way. If you do this, this is to live Christ. This is not to waste your life. Because God delights in being trusted and being enjoyed. It shows his value. So, first we live your calling for God's glory, then enjoy fellowship with God in your work. Thirdly, you can reflect on God's creativity and glory in the way you do your work. We need to reflect what God is really like. We want to put a telescope to the world's eye to see something of God's glory. In other words, our work shouldn't make ourselves look great, but make him look great as our creator. God is the creator who created out of nothing. But he made us in his image, and so he's given us creativity. He's given us the ability not to create from nothing, but to take everything that he has created and to make it and mold it into something beautiful that makes him look great. And that implies three things. For the way we do our work. First of all, it implies the pursuit of excellence. God is a God of, of order and beauty and competence. And that means that as his image bearers who reflect something of his glory, we need to do our work with excellence. As John Piper puts it, our ditches must be dug straight. Our pug fittings must not leak. Our lessons must be prepared well. Our accounting must be accurate. Our surgical incisions should be clean. Our word processing should be accurate and appealing. And I'd like to add, our homes must be neat and orderly in a comfortable refuge. And our meals should be nutritious and attractive. But you see, we can do all of that and still not glorify God. Because we can do it in our own strength and so that we look great. And so the second important thing to remember is that we should work with the strength that God supplies. In other words, our work must be done with a conscious dependence on God's power and a conscious, conscious striving to bring glory to Him. That's what it means to to work in a way that brings him glory. Thirdly, this implies that God has not created us to be idle. You see, God made us to reflect his glorious character or nature. And God is a God who works. And he's made us to work. And so we need to remember that the the, the futility and the frustration and the hardship of work is a result of the fall and of the curse. But work itself is not uh, something to, to avoid. Work itself is something through which we can glorify God. Adam and Eve were both told to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the face of the ground. They were given work to do that would reflect something of the character of God. John Piper says, Idleness does not grow in the soil of fellowship with God. Therefore, those who abandon creative productivity lose the joy of God-dependent, world-shaping, God-reflecting, purposeful work. Ladies, even retired people 
can live truly happy lives if they see creative, useful, God-honoring ways to stay active and productive for the good of other people and for the glory of God. I was watching an interview that Grace Community Church did, and that's the church that John MacArthur is the pastor of, with an elderly couple who's been with the church since the beginning. They were celebrating their 70th wedding anniversary. And I was just amazed to see how this elderly couple, had, and she has multiple sclerosis, MS, and yet how they are still ministering for the Lord, how they make an effort to write letters to all the missionaries of their church, how they are specifically interested in helping children to memorize scripture and to learn the great truths of, of the character of God. They, they use their pension money to buy books to give to children. And the lady admitted that she doesn't mind giving out a couple of dollars as an incentive for the children to memorize passages of scripture. What a, what a wonderful way to use your retirement years. Remember that in God's kingdom, no one ever goes on ultimate retirement. Yeah, our normal work, our day jobs, those will change. But we'll never stop working. We labor for him until he takes us home. Do you remember Amy Carmichael? Do you remember how she had that terrible accident that left her bedroom for the last 23 years of her life? Well, even from her bedroom, she continued writing, writing letters of encouragement, writing devotions for their family, seeking to, to use whatever uh, ability she had left in order to serve the Lord. And then when she fell again and was completely left to lying flat on her back, you remember how she used even that time to pray for others. She labored for the Lord right until the end. So live your calling for God's glory. Enjoy fellowship with God in your work. Seek to reflect God's creativity in all that you do. And then fourthly, you need to remember that your work will not save anyone. It is only a way to open the door for speaking the gospel. You see, doing your work will certain, uh, doing your work well will certainly open the door for the gospel. It will show some people something of the glory of God. But it can't in and of itself save anybody. The way you live will open the door for the gospel of Jesus. It will lend credibility to the message you preach. But it is still the gospel message that saves people, not just your life. It's not enough to just do your work for God. People must hear the message from your lips. The way you do your work will increase or decrease the attractiveness of the gospel that you profess but people still need to know that you are a Christian and why you are a Christian and what it means to be a Christian. John Piper says, thinking that our work will glorify God when people don't know that we are Christians is like admiring an effective advert on TV and never, the, the advert never mentions the product. People may be impressed, but they won't know what to buy. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anyone. Now the point of Paul here is not that your work will save anyone. The point is that if you live and work well, obstacles will be removed. In other words, good, honest work is not the saving gospel. But you see, a crooked or dishonest Christian worker will put a roadblock in the way of unbelievers, seeing the beauty of Jesus Christ. The biblical mandate from Colossians 3.23 is whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. So we make much of God, we glorify God in our work when we have such high standards of excellence, such integrity, and such obvious friendliness 
that we don't put any obstacles or stumbling blocks in the way of the gospel, but that we rather are directing people, directing all the attention to the all-satisfying beauty of Jesus Christ. Titus 2.10, which we'll look at in a moment, <clears throat> speaks about adorning the doctrine of God or making the gospel attractive. And that word adorn is the word cosmeo. Cosmeo. I think I put it on there. It's the word from which we get the word cosmetics. It means to make beautiful or make attractive. And we are meant to make the gospel attractive by our lives. It's like a necklace around the neck of a beautiful woman. Not that I'm a beautiful woman. <laughs> but you see, the necklace is not the gospel. The beautiful woman is the gospel. Our work is just the necklace that adorns the beautiful neck of the beautiful woman. So let's look at how we can get a new perspective on work. Because let's face it, ladies, since the fall into sin and God's curse on the ground, work has always been difficult. There's a frustration and a futility to work that just never ends. And those of us living here in Wallace Bay at the moment, oh goodness, with all the dust that is around, we know about that. It seems like when you just finish wiping one side of the house, by the time you get to the other side of the house, you've got to start all over again. There's a never-ending supply of dirty dishes and dirty washing. And even in your secular work, your work outside of the home, I'm sure you've found that there is just this futility and frustration. Is there any way to remedy this? Yes! <laughs> For those who are in Christ Jesus. Now I'll turn to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. Paul, Paul tells Titus, teach the slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. There it is. So that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Now, in our modern context, you can change the slave, slaves and masters to employees and employers. And here is a beautiful, brand new perspective on work. All of a sudden, my work can become an environment in which I demonstrate my salvation. It becomes an opportunity for witnessing. I can adorn, make attractive, cosmeo, the doctrine of God. The doctrine of God, not my creator, not my judge, not my sustainer, but the doctrine of God, my saviour. I can work in such a way that people around me are going to see that God has saved me, that God has delivered me from my sin. You see, work becomes a launching pad for witnessing. The workplace, even though it's part of the curse, can become a sphere of witness for Christ. If you turn to Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 to 24, we see the same thing. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is upon you and to win their favour, but with sincerity of heart and with reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. You see, it's not eye service that the Lord is looking for. In other words, only working well for your employer because they are watching you. We need to remember that the Lord is always watching us. And therefore we are to do our work out of reverence for the Lord. 
Now what's another word for the word reverence there in that passage? Or fear, as the King James Version puts it. How about worshipping? You see, that brings a new dimension to work, doesn't it? Work can become the sphere of my witness, Titus 2, adorning the gospel, and it can become the sphere of my worship. Because all of a sudden, as a Christian, the whole of work takes on a different perspective when it becomes a means of worshipping God. You see, when I do my work to the very best of my ability, I can take my work and offer it back to God as an act of worship. And that's what it says in verse 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for people. You work at the reception, you teach at school, you take x-rays, you do the accounts, you're a nurse or a secretary or whatever you do, do it as an act of worship to the Lord. And then verse 24 says, Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. You see, work becomes the sphere of your witness, Titus 2, as you adorn the doctrine of God. It becomes the sphere of your worship as you do your work as unto the Lord. And it becomes the sphere of your eternal reward. And that changes everything, doesn't it? Because this is not the Ecclesiastes vanity, vanity, all is vanity, frustrating picture of work. It's now become something purposeful and meaningful. Through our salvation, through being in Christ, the curse can be reversed. It can be alleviated. The mundane, routine, lifelong struggle of work can become an opportunity for witness, an opportunity to worship our God, and an opportunity to gain eternal reward. And in that last statement in verse 24, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. What a great statement. And you thought this was only true of preachers of the word of God or other so-called full-time Christian workers. No. You serve Christ if you're a bus driver, if you're a school teacher, a lawyer, a doctor, anybody. Whatever it is you do, whether you work in an office as a secretary or as a receptionist, or whether you work as a radiographer, or whether you work as a policeman or a firefighter, or whatever it is you do, it says you serve the Lord. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Now, all of a sudden, it's a completely different thing. I'm adorning the doctrine of God for the sake of witness. I'm doing my very best and I'm offering it up to the Lord as an act of worship. And I'm actually storing up an eternal reward which the Lord will give me on that day when I stand before him. In that way, you will find that your work is not just a sad cycle of meaninglessness, but that you can do something joy, something of joy and something with eternal purpose. And that is how not to waste your life. Now I just want to end tonight with one final word. A word about priorities. Because everything we've said so far holds true for all our work, whether in the workplace or at home. But if we are to glorify God in all that we do as women, then we also need to live by His priorities. The priorities or the job description that God has specific, specifically given to us as women. Not to do so can seriously damage our witness in this world about God's supreme worth. Where do I get that? Titus chapter 2. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. 
Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Literally, so that the word of God will not be blasphemed. God has given us as women very specific priorities by which to live, to govern our lives. We looked at these in detail when we studied A Woman After God's Own Heart by Elizabeth George. And when we studied Titus chapter 2, these very verses. Let me remind you quickly of those priorities. Our very important priorities, our VIPs, maturity, marriage, motherhood, making a home, mentoring, ministry. Those are the VIPs for us as women. God's five top priorities for our lives through which to glorify Him. Maturity, close attention to our relationship with God. Marriage, loving and serving our husbands and encouraging them. Motherhood, loving and embracing our children and leading them in godliness. Making a home, focusing our hearts on our homes. Mentoring and ministry, in other words, passing on these feminine values. Gospel ministry as we minister for the Lord in the local church. These are to be the main focus of our lives, the main areas in which we as women are to live for the glory of Christ and make much of Him. So to live Christ is to make much of Him. It's to glorify Him in everything that we do. It's the mindset that seeks to exalt Christ in all areas of life by doing things God's way with the strength that He supplies. It's intensely practical. It touches on every area of our lives, from marriage and lovemaking, to raising children and dirty nappies, to budgeting and shopping and reaching out to others in need. But how do we do this? That is, the key to not wasting our lives is found in keeping this focus, keeping our focus right just for today. Living to exalt Christ with the minutes and hours of each day as we follow and live his priorities for our lives. Rather than trying <laughs> to think about what we do and plan for the future. In other words, what I'm saying is, life is lived today. Elizabeth George, in her book, A Woman After God's Own Heart, uses this beautiful illustration. She says, your life and mine are like a string of pearls, strung day after day with our precious days. So if you desire to live for Christ, Focus on having just one good day, one quality day today. After all, as someone has said, every day is a little life and our whole life is but a single day repeated. Every day is just a little life and our whole life is just a single day repeated. What we need to do is to treat each day as if it and it alone is our golden day, our only day. And then what a beautiful string of golden days becoming golden years we will have to live, to give back to the glory of the Lord. So keep that focus on having a good day today. And then at the end of the day, slip that single pearl onto the string of pearls. And the pearls on your strand will then add up to a good life. Each day, live with God's focus, with God's purpose, can be slipped onto the string of pearls one at a time. And as we focus on living each day with a purpose for Christ, they'll add up to a lifetime of pearls that will bring intense glory and praise to our Saviour. But what if your day was a day of failures? A day of merely trying to survive? 
a day of taking shortcuts, a day of neglecting the things you wanted to focus on. We all have those days. Thanks be to God who enables us to forget that day and to reach forward the next morning to press on towards the goal again and again and again to get one more pull on the strap. As Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, I press on to I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. In His power and by His grace, we keep reaching forward for the goal. After all, every morning is a fresh new day, a new opportunity from God to live according to His priorities. We have the privilege of confessing our sins and our failures. And because of Jesus' forgiveness, we have a clean start every single day. So every morning, ladies, remember your goal is simple. Tomorrow morning, get up and aim to have just one good day of living your priorities, living for the glory of God. And then keep focused on following God's plan for your life for just that one day. And in this way, day after day after day, you'll be able to live Christ, which will add up to a lifetime of exalting the Lord Jesus. And then your life will not be wasted. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word to us this evening. Indeed, a great challenge to all of us, especially in these difficult days, Lord, as many of us are working under new pressures and different circumstances. I pray for each of our ladies tonight that you will give us all the grace to make living for Jesus Christ through the priorities you have given us our goal and that you will give us indeed the grace that we need and the strength that we need to be able to live in that way for your glory. Make us creative in the ways in which we can use all of our abilities and all of our gifts and all of our work to bring glory to your name. And Lord, we pray that at the end of the day, we will be able to take our lives, our work, our day, and give it back to you in honour and glory of you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.